class, we talked about segmentation, the dividing of markets into sub-markets. We talked about market sizing, which is quantifying the size of the markets, and targeting, which is ultimately us selecting markets that we're going to penetrate. So market sizing is important because we're going to look at the size of the market either in terms of the number of units sold, the number of um, people in that segment, the dollar size of that market, the growth rate, for example. So in looking at those different criteria, we're going to select markets that we're going to focus on. Because most of the time, it's not feasible for a company to focus on all the markets at the same time. So let's say, for example, we decided that we're going to start a clothing company. Well, we could start a clothing company, and we might say, well, what are some of the things that we would sell? What are some of the things that we could sell in our clothing store? Sure. Shirts, Pins. pants, sweaters, cardigans, cardigans. <laughs> See all these different items: clothing for men, clothing for women, shirts, long sleeve shirts, short sleeve shirts, solid shirts, white shirts, blue shirts, green shirts, yellow shirts, and non-solid shirts. So there's Look at all the variety that we have there. So we need to decide if we're going to um, start a clothing company. All of those items that we identify are categories. Maybe what we're going to do is we're going to focus on jeans, for example. And we're going to use as our criteria the items the, that we mentioned the size of the market, the growth rate, the number of people that buy jeans, the dollar volume for that particular product. So do you see why if we started a category, why it wouldn't be feasible for us to, I mean, if we start a, a company and we're going to um, introduce online, why we have to somehow decide on which segments to focus. And that's why market sizing is so important is because that's one of the main criteria that we're going to use to help us decide. When we do decide, that's called targeting. Targeting is selecting particular segments. And importantly, when we think of the product that we're going to introduce, we need to understand positioning. So we need to understand segmentation, targeting, and positioning. Positioning is a very important concept. Positioning is the space that we occupy in the customer's mind. So the positioning is the space that we occupy in the customer's mind. Now, in terms of our positioning, we might position ourselves head-to-head -head with other competitors, or we might try to differentiate ourselves. So remember the first day we talked about points of parity and points of difference? We need to decide, in terms of positioning, how we're going to position ourselves in the market. Is it going to be head-to-head -head with the competition? So we're going to focus a lot on the points of parity, 
or is it going to be differentiation? Are we going to focus more on the points of difference relative to the competition? And a way that we could visualize that is known as a perceptual map. A perceptual map is a graphic representation of our positioning relative to the competition. So importantly, importantly when we construct a perceptual map, what we're going to show is where we are on the map relative to our competitors. So remember we had talked about market share. And we said, well, it's very impressive if we found out that we sold 500,000 gallons of orange juice. But in of itself, that's not as significant as if we knew what percentage of the total number of gallons of orange juice sold were sold by our company. So if the total market was 1 million gallons of orange juice, and we sold 500,000, that means we sold 50% of the orange juice in the market. Now that's very compelling. But what about if that wasn't the case? What about if the market was not a million gallons, but let's say the market was 10 million gallons? Then what? Then what percentage of the market did we sell? Right. So now we're not selling 50% of the market. Now the amount of orange juice that's sold that carry our brand is only 5% of the market. That's very different in terms of our performance and evaluating our portfolio of products and brands. So the reason why I bring us back there is because when we look at positioning, certainly we want to understand where we're positioned based on certain dimensions, but even more importantly, we want to understand how are we positioned relative to our competitors. And keep in mind that we could reposition ourselves. So again, when we're Preparing a perceptual map, it's not just interesting. Yeah, it might be interesting to Jennifer. It might be interesting to Jesse. It might be interesting to Stephen. But importantly, what we're going to do is use that information to determine the marketing strategies and tactics for the organization. So we can reposition ourselves. What we're trying to understand is how the customers perceive our brand in the marketplace. We're trying to understand how they view us as a brand relative to the competition. Once we know that, then we could decide if we want to change their perception. So they might have a perception that our product is a low quality. How would we change that? We could give out samples and say, here, try it for yourself. You won't die if you drink this. Don't believe what the competitors say. You could uh, research it and prove it. You could prove it uh, on commercials, for example, like when they shave, they do a taste test and stuff. Well, it could be through a taste test, or like um, Jan is saying, give samples. Let's say get some doctors to say, you know, how healthy this for you. Yeah, so you could have testimonials, maybe celebrity endorsements, to help change the perception that our product is a low quality. So if we have, go ahead. Absolutely. So we can advertise. So we can advertise and communicate with the target audience what it is about our product that is unique, what are the features and benefits of our product or service, and 
Maybe we're going to use a celebrity endorsement as part of that commercial. So maybe in your commercial, we're going to have um, a celebrity speak in the commercial and say that basically that they use the product and that's why they have a full head of hair. That they drink orange juice and they're an Olympic gold medal winner. What is it that people believe as it relates to Air Jordans? What is it really, when you think about it, what sort of a, the brand promise, whether it's um, a subliminal message or not, whether it's conscious or unconscious, why do people buy, for example, Air Jordan sneakers? What is the expectation? That it'll make them like, oh, no, go, go ahead. That uh, they'll jump higher? <laughs> exactly! That if you, buy, if you buy these sneakers and wear them, that you're going to be able to, I think maybe what you said is probably more realistic, not jump as high as Michael Jordan, but jump higher. That these sneakers are going to enhance your performance on the court. So using a celebrity to endorse our product can be very compelling. So we can't change our positioning. We have to identify, we talked about this briefly before, the direct competitors and the indirect competitors. Why? Why do we care about identifying the direct and indirect competitors? Why is that significant for us? Why is it significant to understand, for example, the rationale for the Got Milk campaign? So the Got Milk campaign was a campaign that promoted milk. They didn't talk about any particular brands. What they were trying to do is create category need, create primary demand. So it was dairy farmers that got together and pooled their resources to pay for the development and the airing of those commercials to get people to drink more milk. Why did they do that? How did they come upon that idea to say, you're not um, my direct competitor, or even if you are my direct competitor, because you're also a dairy farmer, and you're a dairy farmer, and you're a dairy farmer, and Chantel is a dairy farmer, They identified indirect competitors. They said, if people aren't drinking milk, what are they drinking? Orange juice! Or they're drinking water, Chantel, right? They're drinking water, or they're drinking iced tea, or they're drinking coffee. There's other beverages that they're drinking. So they said, it would be smart for us, strategically, to focus on increasing the usage rate, remember last time we talked about the usage rate, to increase the usage rate, to get people to drink more milk. Their research showed that there are certain reasons why people are drinking orange juice and vice versa. So for the orange juice companies, they feel that their direct competitors or, let's say, for example, Tropicana feels that Minute Maid is a direct competitor. What else? Who would be some of their other direct competitors? Right? Simply Orange. But they also understand that they have some indirect competitors. So does that make sense? If you're an orange juice company, if you're Tropicana, and you're thinking about who's your competition, so remember, we're Tropicana. You said, who's our competition? Right away, you're like, Mint Maid, Simply Orange, right? all these orange juice brands. But importantly, they said, we are aware of some indirect competitors. And when we say that a brand is an indirect competitor, 
That's not to forget about them, to scratch them off our radar screen. That's to help us focus <coughs> on those companies. Because they said, we realized that milk is a competitor. Maybe not a direct competitor. Or maybe you might strategically say, you know what? Milk is a direct competitor. But that's a strategic decision that needs to be made. At a minimum, I think we agree that milk is an indirect competitor. At a minimum, an indirect competitor. And so what did the orange juice companies do with that? Remember, not just interesting, but actionable. What did they do? So they started promoting orange juice that has calcium, vitamin A, vitamin D. Where did they get that idea from? Milk. Who said milk? Why? What's the, what's, what, what does that have to do with Well, uh, milk is best for, known best for its uh, health qualities like calcium. So if you're drinking orange juice with calcium, I like orange juice better than milk, honestly. So. I'll be getting my yeah, absolutely. They see it as a substitute. And so they're trying to, um, they realize that um, a lot of people do drink milk. And so to increase the usage rate of orange juice, they're trying to promote their product as having some of the same benefits as milk. So you see, both the orange juice companies and the milk companies are looking at the category from the same perspective. How interesting, right? Both of them are trying to increase the usage rate, but their approach is a little bit different. Orange juice companies are definitely trying to increase the usage rate. Remember we said usage rate is a behavioral type of segmentation. Product benefit is a behavioral segment type of segmentation. So they're trying to increase the usage rate, and the way that they're doing that is, like you said, they recognize that milk is a substitute, in some cases, for orange juice, so they're gonna promote their product as having same, some of the same benefits. Vitamin A, vitamin D, calcium, and milk, right? Which is closely related to Oreos, right? Because Oreos, tagline is milk's favorite cookie. What, do you agree? Yes. You, think, you think it's true? It's true, right? They're also trying to increase their usage rate and focusing on the core benefits of their product, which is kind of unusual. Because most of the time we don't focus on creating category need or another term that we use. Another term, category need and primary demand is the same thing. We focus on what's called selective demand, which means that we're going to focus on a particular brand. So primary demand, where we're advertising, means that we're focusing on creating demand for an entire category, like milk, or what about, have you seen the commercials for beef? It's what's for dinner, pork, the other white meat. All these are campaigns that are really in the minority in terms of advertising, because their focus is on primary demand, trying to create more demand and increase the usage of beef, pork, milk. Most of the time we focus on selective demand to get customers to buy a particular brand, whether it's Minute Maid or Tropicana or Simply Orange. So in terms of the competitive set, we need to know who are our direct and who are our indirect competitors. What about, let's take another example before we go on and we're going to look at a perceptual map. We're going to create a perceptual map together. Fun times, right? All right, so who do you think, now think about this, this is strategic, 
Let's think about who are the direct and indirect competitors for McDonald's. Now take your time, all right? So we want to think about first who are the direct competitors and then who are the indirect competitors for McDonald's. What do you think? Brandon, go ahead. Who's uh, one of the direct competitors for McDonald's? Burger King. Burger King. Wendy's. So you see where Brandon is going with this? Somebody else? So we have for McDonald's, we're saying that their direct competitors are Burger King, Wendy's, what else? White Castle. Who said White Castle? Okay, they had White Castle. Now, who can tell me what these four fast food restaurants have in common? Burgers. They sell meat. Yeah, they sell hamburgers. And they're some type of meat. We're not really 100% sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, you know, some type of beef, but we don't need to real. that's not really um, digress there. Go ahead, Stephen. Oh, that's interesting. I so, like Domino's. All right, so let's see. So this is a strategic um, point of view. Here we're saying these are fast, um, fast food burger places. Looks like that's what we've uh, come up with here. And then another way, Stephen is saying that, well, these are fast food restaurants, but then maybe we need to look at, um, let's see, like, um, fast cooked meals. Yeah, yeah, to go. <laughs> or another way, go ahead. Right. Applebee's, let's say. Yes. Well, that's something we need just to decide strategically. I think definitely these are fast food, and then we would also have those that are not, like you're saying, like Applebee's, right? They sell burgers, and uh, GIF, right? They sell burgers, and, and other places. But that's something we need to decide. Are we focusing on just fast food restaurants, or do we need to say, you know something? They sell a burger that's $9.99. Is that something that's a concern to us? That's something, that's a strategic decision that the uh, um, executive team needs to make. Yeah. What about Subway? You know, like they always campaign against, you know, you can have a healthier meal with this. So, if we're staying within fast food, right, if we're saying that this is where, where the line is being drawn, then if these are the direct competitors, then Subway might be an indirect competitor because they're a fast food restaurant. And then I heard somebody say Domino's? Yeah. Domino's. And what else? Taco Bell. Taco Bell. KFC. KFC. So all that we have, one, two, three, four, these eight companies are all fast food restaurants. But we're making the strategic decision to classify these as direct competitors because those are their product is burgers. And these are also fast food restaurants, but the item, and we're going to talk about items, product lines, and product mixes, their items are different. They sell chicken, they sell tacos, they sell pizza. So, should we be concerned about KFC? Yeah, only because the direct things are things that are similar and indirect are substitutes. Yes, exactly. So, these are substitutes. So, if you want fast food, if you're not going to get a burger, then you might get chicken or you might get pizza. So, 
you see why I think this is a good example? We're not saying, okay, we're just going to forget about the indirect competitors, right? We're not going to forget about the indirect competitors. It's for us to keep them on the radar screen, for us to understand strategically who are our competitors. But it's important to say some are direct and some are indirect. So absolutely, if I'm McDonald's, I'm very concerned about KFC because I know if they don't get a burger, then they might get chicken or they might get pizza. So we're targeting the same customer, basically at the same price point. So the same value proposition, fast food at a low price. And heart disease. <laughs> Basically, right now they all offer the same value proposition? Yeah. What happens um, if you look at the way some of these um, companies are organized, you'll see that what we're saying has been implemented in the marketplace. So, for example, KFC. Pizza Hut and Taco Bell are owned by the same company. Does anybody know the name of the company? When I tell you, you're going to think, he just makes this stuff up. The name of the company is Yum. I'm, I'm not kidding. Yum. Is the, I don't see, look, you see, they don't believe me. They don't, they don't believe me. Really, the name of the company is Yum. And it's a company that was, these companies used to be a part of Pepsi. They spun them off and formed this company, Yum. And what's interesting is that these restaurants are co-located. So if you go even, for example, to King's Plaza, you come in from the parking lot there, and they have a KFC, a Taco Bell, and a Pizza Hut in the same store. So doesn't that support what she was saying? Tell us your name. Yeah, mom. Yes. Kiamani, doesn't that support what Kiamani is saying? Is that we recognize that those are substitutes for, for each other, so one company <coughs> even sells all three of those. They feel like, well, we can't lose. If you come in here, you're either going to buy the chicken, the pizza, or the tacos. And at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter to us because that money is going all back to the corporate organization to the young company. You'll see, you'll, you'll see, check later. So that's, that shows that they understand that, yes, these items are substitutes for each other. Now when we use the term product, and we are going to do a perceptual map before we go, but when we use the term product, a product includes both a good and a service. Now you might from your own personal experience or um, your purchasing habits you might not think of products that way, but we have to be familiar with this terminology in marketing. When we talk about products, we're talking about goods and services. So a good is something that's tangible. And a service is something that's intangible. But whether it's a tangible product or an intangible product, it's still a product. So both goods and services are products. Now, those products could either be consumer products or business products. So again, products could be goods or services. A good is something that's tangible, a service is intangible, and those products could be business products or consumer products. And there's some 
classifications that we use when we talk about these different types of products. And let me say this, that the reason why it's important to classify these products this way, so for consumers, convenience products, shopping, specialty, unsought, you're like, why does that matter? I just, I went, I bought a TV. I bought an iPad. I bought orange juice. Why does it matter? Why do we need to go through? Come on, coach. You're making it too difficult. It's a product. Why do I need to know if it's convenience or shopping or specialty or unsort? The reason is, who knows? Besides me. <laughs> Besides me. Who knows? The question is, why do we need to understand the classification of different consumer products? Why isn't it just enough to say, here comes Edward. Edward. Yes. Edward is here, everybody. Yes, Stephen? These people buy different things for different reasons, even though they might look like they're in the same category at first. Yes? Anybody want to add to that? So once we classify the product as an organization, that Absolutely. So once we understand that the product is a convenience product, so we need to understand the consumer behavior. We need to understand if it's a convenience product, a shopping product, a specialty product, or an unsought product, because that's going to determine our marketing strategy, our marketing tactics. That's going to influence our marketing mix. So again, it's not just like interesting, oh, our product is a convenience product. Who cares? No, as an organization, as marketers, we care. So what's a convenience product? Toothpaste. Toothpaste is a good example. Yes. So fast food is a convenience product. Orange juice. These are purchases that are made frequently, so they are frequent purchases that are usually inexpensive. And they're what we would describe as low involvement purchases. So there's not a lot of research that's done. It's pretty much a routine purchase. It's inexpensive. We purchase a product frequently. So we go into the store, we buy a half a gallon of Tropicana orange juice. And we might do that twice a week. Or we go into the store and every morning we buy Red Bull. Red Bull. If you drink that, it'll bring your ancestors back from the dead. <laughs> Those are examples of convenience products. Any questions about that? Does everybody see why that is? Why you would designate those items as convenience products? So they're purchased frequently. They're generally inexpensive. They're routine purchases. Low involvement. We don't do um, <clears throat> extensive research. Those are convenience products. Now, that's different from a shopping product. A shopping product is more expensive. A shopping product is more expensive. Actually, I think that's more appropriate. So, for example, a shopping product is one that we consider a variety of alternatives. Like, for example, a TV. Suppose you were going to buy a TV. Which one to buy? You have TVs that are plasma. You have TVs that are LCD. You have TVs that are LED.
alternatives. You have TVs that are smart TVs. You have smart TVs that have access to a web browser, and you have smart TVs that have access only to web applications. So, so all smart TVs are not the same. Some smart TVs, you could navigate on the screen and click on the icon for YouTube or Netflix. Other smart TVs, you actually have a web browser that comes up. And you could type in our course website, or you could type in the Brooklyn College website, or you could type in the website for Macy's. Alternatives. So a shopping product is one that's fairly expensive, so if you want to buy a high-definition LED 1080p smart television at Best Buy, it's going to cost about $1,000. But what about if you want to buy one that's not smart? One that's instead of LED, that's LCD or plasma. If you want to buy a plasma television that's not smart, you could buy those for like $400. And then you have the different screen sizes. You could buy ones that are 32 inches, ones that are 40 inches, 42 inches, 46 inches, 50 inches, 55 inches, 60 inches. So you, somebody could literally go into Best Buy on Bay Parkway Right? And stay there like four hours trying to figure out what TV to buy. So that's an example, right? That's an example of a shopping good. Where you're going to spend a lot of time. It's a fairly expensive good. I'm talking about spending something like around $1,000. It's very different than, than buying a, a gallon of orange juice. That's an example of a shopping good. Does that make sense? I mean, could you see yourself going in there, Chantel, and being there for like four or five hours looking at the different brands, Sony, Samsung, um, Sharp, Plasma, LCD, LED, smart TVs, not smart TVs, 27 inch, 40 inch, 42 inch, so that's more of a high involvement purchase. We have all these alternatives. Now, any questions about that? Now that's different from a specialty good. A specialty good is usually something that's quite expensive and it could be, for example, let's say a Rolls Royce. It could be for example, an expensive watch, like let's say um, a Rolex. See, that's the focus. See, that's like, for example, um, my unique selling proposition as a teacher is the students that take my classes, the expectation is that in their career, they're going to be successful and be able to own a Rolex. Those who are OK with Timex, they take the other guy. But those who want Rolex, they take the class with coach, right? So uh, expensive watch or an expensive car is an example of a specialty good. I mean, would that be synonymous with like luxurious goods just like that? Or is there something else beyond luxury goods? Well, yeah, I mean, this is like ultra luxury because you're thinking like um, maybe a um, a Feral Gamo bag, right? So this is a nice bag, um, but that's not in the category, I wouldn't consider that in the category of specialty because these are usually very expensive. And importantly, so we're talking about price here. Price is one of the marketing mix elements, but in terms of distribution, 
This has convenience goods, have a very high level of distribution. Shopping goods also have a very high level of distribution, like with the TVs. You can go to Best Buy, you can go to Walmart, you can go to Target, you could buy a um, $1,000, $2,000 TVs at a lot of stores. Is that right? No? You're not sure? I mean, TVs, you could buy them pretty much in a lot of different places, in a lot of different stores. Convenience goods, right? There's Dunkin' Donuts, 7-Eleven, Starbucks, everywhere where you could go in and buy a soda or a bottle of water. So those have high levels of distribution. Specialty products, which are usually very expensive, have a limited amount of distribution. So that means there's not a lot of stores that sell Rolex. Orange juice, you can get on every corner. For some people, Grey Goose is a convenience product. <laughs> Which you could also buy on like every corner, because there's literally a liquor store on every corner. But not for um, Rolls Royce. Yeah, of course, there's some Rolls Royce dealerships in New York. There's certainly places um, in, um, in the metro area where you could buy Rolex and other um, expensive watches like um, Breitling, for example, um, Philippe. Yeah, there's, certainly there's places, but there's not a lot of places. You don't have that high level of distribution that you have with shopping and convenience products. Questions? So I would say some of the luxury products that you're thinking of, like if you're thinking about, um, let's say, like LV and things like that, I would say those are more um, shopping than specialty. Although, I mean, you know, LV um, products are quite expensive, but not in the same price point category as when you think of specialty goods that have limited distribution. Any questions about those so far? Go ahead, Yana. Um, we were talking about goods, right? Um, does the same category, same grade that apply to services? Ah, well, we're going to use a different um, classification um, for service. All right, so we're going to come back to that. But I do want to finish up with um, the last classification for consumer goods, which is unsought. So an unsought, the price could vary. So an unsought good could be um, expensive or not so expensive, but what makes it different from the other goods is that it's something that we're not aware of or we're not looking for. We're not actively looking for. So any of those other products, you could say, well, you're looking for it. Even if you're not doing a lot of research, you're looking for a bottle of water. Now, it might be right down the hall, but you're still looking for it. You're still looking for a TV. You're still looking for a watch. But an unsought good is one that you're not looking for. Like, for example, what? What might be something that you're not looking for? burial plot. Yeah. Right? A burial plot. It's not something that um, some of you might even be unaware. And some of you are just like, well, I'm, not, I'm just not looking for that. <laughs> Maybe, for example, let's say, you know, some types of insurance. Like, let's say, for example, maybe life insurance. Life insurance, you may not be looking for, but car insurance, you are. So we can't just um, like classify all insurance as unsought, but I think 
A lot of people drive cars, so a lot of people, I would say, are looking for insurance. It doesn't mean everybody. It doesn't mean everybody here has a car, everybody's looking for car insurance, but that's certainly more common than people in your age group looking for life insurance. So life insurance, you might say, is an unsought good. A burial plot is an unsought good. Oh, doesn't this all determine the demographic? Because it could be a burial plot could be a so good for people who are sick. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm not saying that it's not. I'm just saying that. Um, I'm just saying that it de it depends, right? So it might be something that. Um, that is unsought to certain individuals. So there's still a market for that. There's still um, markets for those products. And actually, life insurance, I probably would describe more of as a service than, um, than probably a, a product. But what do you think? Do you, do you agree in terms of unsought goods, specialty, shopping, convenience, right? That there's differences in the types of products and specifically now we're talking about goods that we buy. And we need to understand as marketers the consumer behavior. We need to understand the behavior of consumers. Because if we're selling, if our product, if our good is unsort, then we need to figure out how, through our marketing strategies and tactics, that we're going to get people to buy that product. And if our product is a specialty good that's quite expensive but has limited distribution, our challenge is how do we get people to buy our product? And you can see how the challenges for us varies. So for a specialty good, we have it's a bigger challenge for us because we have limited distribution. But for a shopping good, there's a greater amount of distribution, and for a convenience good, it's pretty much everywhere. So do you think it's a lot easier as marketers to sell convenience goods that are very inexpensive and are at every corner? So our strategy and approach, our tactics, our marketing mix is going to be impacted by how we classify the products. And in this case, we're specifically talking about goods. So we're talking about consumer goods. Now, in terms of products, three terms that we need to be familiar with. Item, line, and mix. So as a marketing organization, we're going to sell an item. An example of an item would be a 16 gigabyte iPad. That's an example of an item. One item, one SKU. Who knows what an SKU is? SKU number. Yes, it's a SKU number. SKU stands for Stock Keeping Unit. So every item has its own Stock Keeping Unit number. So our example would be a 16 gigabyte iPad. That's an item. An example of a product line would be a group of items. So a product line, a product line is a group of items. So we said an example of an item is a 16 gigabyte iPad. That's an item. 
one item, one stock keeping unit. A product line is a group of items. So a product line in this case would be uh, so a group of um, a group of items would be a 16 gigabyte iPad, a 32 gigabyte iPad, and a 64 gigabyte iPad. That would be a product line, which is a group of items. So a 16 gigabyte iPad is an item. A 32 gigabyte iPad is an item. A 64 gigabyte iPad, so figure right, is an item. When we group all of those items together, those are what makes up our product line. Questions about that? So we see what the items are. 16 gigabyte iPad is an item. 32 gigabyte iPad is an item. When we group those together, that's our product line. This is our product line. This is the Apple iPad product line. We have a 16 gigabyte, a 32 gigabyte, and a 64 gigabyte. Now the product mix is the company's product lines grouped together. All right, so follow me. The item we talked about, we identified a single stock, keep, stock keeping unit. That's an item. The product line is a group of items and the product mix is a group of product lines. Everybody got it? So the product line is a group of items, and the product mix is a group of product lines. So the product mix would be the iPad, the iPhone, the iPod, and these we said could be 16 gigabyte, 32 gigabyte, 64 gigabyte, these could be 4, 4S, 5, iPad, we have the, well, we could use, we could, we could put the, um, the, the sub-brands here, the Nano, the Shuffle, and we have the different um, 20 gigabyte, 60 gigabyte, et cetera. So the subsequent upgrade for those product lines would be the mix and not the line itself. Well, then the product line is going to change. So at this point in time, that's our product line. But then we could replace our product line. So as part of the new product development process of identifying opportunities, creating concepts, manufacturing products, launching those products, and tracking the performance, right, that's an example of a new product development process. We're going to continue to innovate and introduce new items, and those new items we're going to group together and classify them as a product line. And then all the product lines of the company we group together and we call that a product mix. So an organization could have multiple product mixes. We could sell phones, we could sell tablets, we could sell MP3 players. Is this a good example? Or do you want to take another example? What about Sony? Would Sony be a good... Who, who could give us an example of an item that Sony sells? PlayStation 3? What else? Anything else? All right, so we're going to look at, for example, let's say the, a Sony item would be 
Yeah, let, let's, let's, say, let's say, look at a TV. We've been looking at TVs before. So we're going to say an LED TV that's 40 inches. <coughs> that's one item. Then their product line could be LED TVs, LCD TVs, plasma TVs. See, this is just one item. But then in their product line, they have a lot of different items. And then in their product mix, they have TVs, cameras, cameras computers, what else? Computers. computers. What was it? PlayStation. Games. So this is another example of we have an item, we take all the items, we group them together to have a product line, then we group together all our product lines, and that's our product mix. All of these things, the reason why we go through the trouble and make the effort to classify them, that's what we're doing, we're classifying our products is that's what we're going to use as the basis, in large part, for our marketing plan. That's what's going to define our strategies and our tactics. That's what's going to influence our marketing mix. Because if we just have one product line, that's going to be a different type of marketing plan than if we're responsible for advertising TVs, cameras, computers, gaming consoles. Do you agree? And that's why we're looking at these. That's why we need to understand this. What are our product lines? What are our product mixes? So that we could develop an effective, for example, advertising campaign, or distribution strategy, or pricing strategy. See, when you just look at this as an item, it's out of context. So you might be saying, well, how much should we charge for this? But if we look at the product line, then we might, it might make more sense to have a strategy that's like this. Which is a good, better, best pricing strategy. So you see right away, we're just looking at an item. Didn't really give us the chance to develop a strategy for the organization. But when we look at it in the context of a product line, then we see where there's an opportunity for us to effectively manage the marketing mix. Now this is very compelling, isn't it? To have a TV at $400, at $700, at $900. And of course, I'm sure they have ones that are at 500, 600, right? 700, 800, 900. But this is what we would refer to as a good, better, best pricing strategy. And the uh, idea is that You're going to pay more and get more. So at a higher price, you'll have a product that has more features and benefits. Now remember, we looked at um, the brand hierarchy. And we said there's a corporate brand, a master brand. And very often, companies use sub-brands as part of their branding strategy. That's also something that can come out of this analysis. So for example, the brand used here is PlayStation, right? And what about here? Do they have any 
let's say for computers, the bio. Examples of sub brands because the product line, at the product line level, we have a master brand, which is Sony. The corporate brand is Sony, what? So that's the corporate brand, or it's Sony Corporation, depending on the way the, um, the organization is structured. And by the way, they changed their names over time, but uh, one part that we know is consistent is Sony, because there's so much brand equity in the Sony brand name. But importantly, their master brand is Sony, without the corporation without INC, just Sony. That's the master brand that you see on all their products. But they use sub-brands. Like here we identified the Sony Bio is a laptop that the company sells. And if you want to buy a Sony Bio that has a third generation i7 Intel processor that has one terabyte of hard drive space and 12 gigabyte of RAM, that's about $1,900. What was that? <laughs> yeah, they have that. That's um, the S, part of their um, S product line. If you want to get the E product line, then the item, the E product, they have um, actually 16 gigabytes of RAM, but they have a much slower processor. So things to could think about, right, in the marketplace, because we need to identify who are our direct competitors to Sony and our indirect competitors. In some may argue that um, Apple, for example, they might say is not a direct competitor. Or maybe we would say that they are, but for, for different reasons. Questions? All right. Now, businesses, we also have business products. Business products fall into two classifications, components and support. So a component is something that goes into the final product. So it could be some type of raw material, which would be a component. So it's part of the manufacturing process. So an Intel chip is a component. And the reason why we describe that as business to business versus business to consumer. See, up until now, we were just talking about Sony selling to consumers, Tropicana selling to consumers, Apple selling to consumers. Now we're talking about businesses selling to other businesses. See, that was business to consumer. Now we're going to switch gears and talk a little bit about business to business. A component is something that one business could sell to another. Intel is a great example of that. So Intel sells their chips, their processors to Sony, to Toshiba, exactly, to other companies. And that's incorporated into their product, into their computer, into their laptop. That's a component part. Another type of business product 
is what we refer to as a support product, which would be, for example, what? What would be an example of a support product? Oh, Geek Squad. Um, but is the Geek Squad providing a service to consumers or to businesses? Could be, could be to both. Um, that's an interesting situation because um, they might actually be providing um, a service to both. But let's focus, let's stay on products for now. Maybe a keyboard? A keyboard, yes, absolutely. That could be an example of um, a component. You're saying as a support. Yeah, I would say as a, as a support. Um, so a mouse, for example, for a computer. That might be something that one business sells to another. So you've already purchased, right? We're not talking about manufacturing the computers anymore. Now we're talking about office supplies, like you need to buy a mouse for your computer, you need to buy a keyboard, you need to buy paper clips. Now you might think, coach, come on, you can't make any money selling paper clips. Well, what about if you had to sell paper clips to an organization like Brooklyn College? So there's different types of organizations. There's businesses, there's institutions, government. So what about if you wanted to sell paper clips to the state of New York? So when we use the term business to business, it's not just corporations or what we think of in terms of, of, of businesses. It could be a variety of organizations like the ones that I mentioned. It could be a business as we normally think of a business, an office, or it could be the government, or it could be institutions like hospitals, for example. Well, don't hospitals buy paper clips? Now, maybe that's not the um, something that um, you think of right away. But what about Kings County? They have a, they have offices, and they need to buy paper clips, and they need to buy bleach. They need to buy things to clean the floor. They need to buy things to clean the windows. They need to buy mops and brooms. All of those are what we would describe in um, business to business as support products. So the broom, the paper clip, that's not part of the product. That doesn't go into the final product. And let's hope that if you ever go to Kings County that you don't leave with a paper clip inside you because that would be like um, above and beyond what you would have expected.